morning, everyone. My name is Aris Arugay. I'm a professor of political science at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and trustee of the Foundation for the National Interest Incorporated. And on behalf of FNI, ARS, FACS, and the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this uh, Econ Security Talks entitled Understanding Economic Security as a Pillar of Foreign Policy. To start things off, uh, may we hear from Dr. Vincent Suzel, resident representative of FES Philippines, for his opening remarks. Dr. Suzel, you have the virtual floor. Thank you very much, Aris. Magadang umaga. Good morning and welcome to our first Econ Security Talk we have together. My name is Vincent Hutzel. I have been the resident representative in the office of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung here in Manila for a good year and a half. The Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is a political foundation from Germany that is committed to the basic values of social democracy and international exchange and cooperation. In our different offices all across Asia, we have been organizing discussions on geopolitics for a number of years. An important insight from these discussions forums is that geopolitics is much more than the superficial consideration of geographical spheres or influence. Geopolitics must be thought of and understood from the perspective of diverse interrelationships, interests and dependencies of very different policy areas, economy, trade, international, uh, internal and external security policy, supply chains, financial flows, migration, food security, climate protection, you name it, much, much more. All these are playing grounds of geopolitical conflicts. In the past three years, we have been made aware of the immense challenges we are facing, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, but also natural disasters, climate change and problems in the supply chains show us how fragile our global and globalized coexistence is. Together, we must find ways to meet these challenges. With a foundation for national interest, we held a series of discussions here in the Philippines last year entitled Beyond Maritime Security. We also dealt with issues that went far beyond the tradi traditional concept of security and also affected the economic development of the Philippines. Through these discussions, we have learned to focus more on topics that are not otherwise in the limelight of classic security policy discussions, but also are of central importance for them. Therefore, we like to start a discussion in this series about strategies for economic security. This brings the concept of sustainability to the fore, a balance between economy, ecology and social affairs, which is based on peace and on security. A sustainable economic policy should therefore not only focus on the pure growth, but rather also take into account the protection of natural resources and the needs of the citizens. Economic security goes hand in hand with ecological security and social security. The only question is, how do we do this? I am excited to see what answers we will find to these questions in the course of today's and the following events. This is the first of four talks, talks we are planning for the next month, and we hope this series of discussions will produce relevant policy recommendations that we and you can use in your work. Fortunately, we managed to find outstanding personalities to start the series who will certainly provide 
us with impulses in this discussion. I would like to say a big thank you to Eric Gerardo Tamayo, Assistant Secretary for Asia Pacific in the Economic Cooperation Department of Foreign Affairs here in the Philippines, Alan Gapti, Assistant Secretary for the Industry Development and Trade Policy Group in the Department of Trade and Industry, and of course, uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Laura Del Rosario from the Foundation for National Interests. It's great to have you with us again. A big thank you also goes to Dr. Aris A. Arugai for today's moderation. Thank you, Aris, for that. And last but not least, I would like to thank Sir Julie Amador and his team from Amador Research Services, the Foundation for National Interests and Facts, as well as my dear colleagues and my team from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung for organizing that. We are very grateful to have partners who bring together personalities from different sectors like the government, academia, and so, uh, civil society. And we want to create a framework for this discussion. I wish us all exciting and ex uh, inspiring lectures and an instructive discussion. So the stage is yours. Mara Ming Salamat. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Huzel, for your uh, remarks uh, to start off our program uh, this morning. Before I introduce our keynote, may I remind uh, all our participants regarding the house rules of this webinar. <laughs> Kindly mute your accounts when not speaking to avoid disruptive noise. And participants who may have questions after uh, both of our speakers have uh, finished their talks may post their comments uh, on the Q&A uh, function of, uh, of Zoom with respect to time. Uh, I will collect this and present to the panelists accordingly. Uh, a gentle reminder that this webinar shall be conducted under Chatham House rule in which participants are free to use the information received from this webinar but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers or any of the other participants uh, may be revealed. Okay, uh, let me introduce our, uh, our keynote speaker for this morning's webinar, Mr. Eric uh, Gerardo Tamayo. Mr. Tamayo is currently Assistant Secretary for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation of the Department of Foreign Affairs. He is a career minister in the Philippine Foreign Service and the executive director of the Philippine APEC National Secretariat. He is currently assigned to the office of the Undersecretary for International Economic Relations. He served as minister and consul general of the Philippine Embassy in uh, Ottawa, Canada, alternative representative to the UN International Civil Aviation Organization, an alternative focal point to the Secretariat of the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity prior to his current position. Eric has also served as interim charge d'affaires at the embassy. He previously served in the Philippine embassy in Tokyo, Japan, was also assigned as the principal assistant in the office of the secretary. Afterwards, he was named chief of the economic diplomacy unit and special assistant to the secretary of state for foreign affairs. Asak Tamayo holds a master of arts in international affairs and relations from Tuff University's uh, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He has received additional specialized training and capacity building for WTO trade negotiations at the Civil Service College of Singapore as part of the France-Singapore Joint Cooperation Program and in economic diplomacy at the Asian Institute of Management. Uh, without much further ado, uh, Ms. Asek Eric Tamayo, you have the virtual floor. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arugay, and uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Dr. Vincent Hosel, Ambassador Laura Del Rosario, Admiral Jose Luis Alano, Asik Alan Hepti, and also Dr. Aris Arugay, panelists and moderator, distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning uh, from Bangkok, Thailand, where I find myself uh, currently 
uh, attending the uh, APEC Tourism Minister's meeting together with uh, our Tourism Minister, uh, the Honorable Cristina Garcia Frasco. But more on this event later. First of all, I wish to congratulate the Foundation for the National Interest and the Friedrich uh, Ebert Stiftung and their partners, the Amador Research Services and Fax Asia for organizing this webinar, especially at a time so pivotal as the Philippines, the region, and the rest of the world are facing the most pressing economic and security challenges of our time. I wish to thank the organizers for extending this invitation to the Department of Foreign Affairs, as the DFA being the prime agency mandated to formulate and implement foreign policy. And on behalf of Undersecretary Carlos Di Soreta, Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and International Economic Relations. And I am honored to deliver a message for this session's topic, Understanding Economic Security as a Pillar for Foreign Policy. Let me begin with the end. The end of the State of the Nation Address of President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. on July 25. He said before an esteemed audience uh, applauding his proposed reforms that the State of the Nation is sound. Sound has a number of meanings, but in the context, it is referred to as a condition or one that is financially and economically secure. Therefore, how incredibly fitting and timely that the president chose to leave a message of economic security amidst times of crisis in the world, including food and energy scarcity, climate change challenges, supply chain disruptions, rising prices, and global inflation, and the lingering pandemic, among others. And as also mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Hazel, uh, in his opening remarks. Now, transitioning from the Duterte administration and the Marcos administration, the state of the economy and the country is considered to be on a sound recovery track. We are estimated or for forecast to grow. Uh, the economic growth is forecast uh, projected to be at 6.5 to 7.5% by the end of 2022. It is therefore imperative that the new administration build on such a strong macroeconomic fundamentals bequeathed by the previous administration in developing its economic development agenda and to translate this into sustained and inclusive economic security for the next six years. Economic security, after all, is an end goal considering the current and intended state of the economy and economic affairs of the country. And the new administration will be expected to utilize all tools at its disposal to promote consumption, raise productivity, increase investment, spend for infrastructure, and work towards increased export and balance terms of trade. With this in mind, perhaps it would be useful to pause it how to characterize Philippine policy, foreign policy as it contributes to economic security and frame this according to three points or three Cs uh, to describe this. First C is that this economic policy is constant, constantly and consistently an instrument to pursue national interest. Now, the pursuit of the Philippines' economic interest has been an important component of Philippine foreign policy since the formal inception of our foreign service. Over the years, the foreign service has endeavored to complement and move forward with various economic development and industrialization strategies now currently embodied under the aspirations of Ambition 2040 in the long term, the Philippine Development Plan in the medium term, and the eight-point agenda defined by the new regime in place. The DFA, through its foreign service posts, and also in partnership with our uh, uh, other government agencies, such as the Department of Trade and Industry, the Department of Agriculture, uh, among others, uh, try to promote Philippine goods and services abroad focusing on exports with competitive advantages and potential in terms of, uh, of innovation. And our posts and missions facilitate bilateral, regional, and multilateral uh, engagements on trade and other trade-related initiatives and endeavors that ensure Philippines' interests are represented in this various and articulated in this various forum. And we also, uh, in our modest uh, undertaking, contribute to investment promotion. Our posts actively seek needs and opportunities guided by the National Investment Priorities Plan and often serves as initial contact for potential investors. And we also work towards working with our partners in the tourism industry to help 
promote the tourism industry in our country. Forging linkages and alliances to advance international cooperation and exchange on matters related to economic development is without a doubt a major aspect of DFA's work and hand in hand and in, in, in line with the priorities also of, of our partner agencies. We work with the DEA on food security, DTI and DOST on, on promoting uh, uh, the, the activities of our enterprises abroad and the uh, transfer of technology. And we endeavor to collaborate and identify with them in, in, and cultivate other, other relationships by way of pursuing technical cooperation and exchange of best practices. In the science and technology field alone, the DFA has been instrumental in organizing the science and technology advisory councils from the ranks of the Filipino diaspora abroad. The core of national inter economic interest for a developing country such as the Philippines is the need to ensure the economic security of its people by securing, securing their livelihood, welfare, and enhanced quality of life. The necessary conditions for this to happen would be sustained econ inclusive economic growth, such as what we had seen prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore, uh, we look towards improving and increasing uh, uh, and tweaking the levers involving consumption, production, and government spending. And to this, we also add to the mixed trade, which is key economic uh, driver of growth. And to maintain this and to, to promote this, we must continue to foster our uh, relationships with our major export markets like the US, China, ASEAN, EU, and Japan. Moreover, investment remains essential. It, it may be noted that the Philippines' mindset between inbound and as, outbound investment has been quite asymmetrical, while our many of our neighboring countries have proven to be quite adept and prolific in complementing inbound investment programs with out, outward and outbound investment strategies. Moreover, participation in regional governance mechanisms in turn drives various internal regulatory reforms in the country and help build capacities through technical cooperation. The second C we should also consider is that this kind of economic foreign policy changes, changing according to context and challenges. How economic securities operationalize in foreign policy is continuously evolving, shaped both by what is happening externally and our domestic realities. It may be recalled as the Philippines was emerging from the ravages of World War II, and after gaining independence from the U.S., strengthening trade relations and securing financial and economic assistance were some of the foreign policy thrusts of the newly constituted government. In the early post-independence years, the DFA had continuously worked to enhance its trade relations with its partners and funnel development aid, as well as actively support the economic uh, um, and, uh, movement of uh, our Kababayans abroad. As traditional political lines were blurred with the end of the Cold War, globalization further flourished. President Corazon Aquino in 1997 mandated the DFA to resolutely design and harness foreign relations in the active pursuit of rapid national and sustained long-term growth and development. This policy initiative is now uh, often referred to as development diplomacy. Recalling that the prospect of a fortress Europe uh, represented by the European Union and the emergence of NAFTA uh, ma uh, required uh, a response from the Philippines and its neighbors through ASEAN and APEC uh, for closer co uh, collaboration and coordination. More so that we see the COVID-19 in Ukraine uh, conflict also poses challenges to ensuring the operations of uh, supply chains. And similarly, moving uh, that this uh, imperative to work more closely together in the, in the international community. Today, the challenge before us is reinforcing the positive link between economic liberalization and regional and international integration in the pursuit of poverty reduction. We have seen, and as evidenced by sustained economic growth in the past, 
and before the pandemic, the reduction of poverty has been made possible by the emerging economies who have uh, become more global trade powerhouses such as China, India, and Brazil. And therefore, this kind of uh, mindset remains at the core, at the center of a critical strategy that the Philippines should continue to pursue at the multilateral, regional, and bilateral levels. The participation of key Philippine economic actors in the global economy, particularly micro, small, and medium enterprises and startups, can also open up more opportunities for growth and income, which in turn can generate employment and greater prosperity. And at the same time, there's also a need to shield certain sectors of the economy that are considered vulnerable or critical to economic development. And we see that continuing in terms of uh, agriculture uh, and the endeavor to, to uh, protect them from uh, the uh, uh, disruptive impact of opening up markets uh, as defined by policy over the years. And we should also look at exploring financing funding options, uh, options which have also expanded uh, from the traditional funding sources. We also now have uh, venture capitalists and angel funding funders getting more and more into the mix of options. And the Philippines uh, uh, looks to improve its policy relevance and responsive to a new and emerging economic mm -hmm. reality for the 21st century. Even as we can say that every geographic region has a different set of policy responses to a new and emerging global economic realities, uh, there, there, there remains the, the cross-cutting uh, issues that affect us all. And while we can base each other's, uh, each region's constituent countries, their, their responses to their own unique domestic uh, economic conditions, uh, there remains many commonalities in the uh, 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 issues that factor in the formulation of policies. Nevertheless, these new realities uh, must be reckoned with, especially when we look at the impact mm -hmm. of uh, and the emergence of new technologies and digitalization and the various applications uh, in economic and commercial activities of artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics. Now, these uh, innovations significantly enhance productivity and efficiency. They could potentially impact on economic security by displacing workers, obsoleting certain tasks, skills, and other occupations and professions. And uh, we must pay attention to uh, the impact uh, this may have uh, on our economies, especially for for those countries uh, who uh, need to uh, further adjust uh, and have access to these technologies. To be sure, the rapid pace of technological innovation and its contribution to facilitating commerce and economic exchanges uh, has been framed or described by uh, such concepts as the fourth industrial revolution, the globalization 4.0, web 3.0, and uh, 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 these trends have been creeping uh, slowly over the years uh, and impacting on the capability uh, of, the, uh, of the people to uh, respond to these changes. These developments could be particularly challenging for services dependent economies like the Philippines, which rely on income generated from uh, the various uh, knowledge process uh, uh, operations and the remittances of overseas Filipinos. This risk uh, brought about by uh, technological changes in innovation is further exacerbated when international rulemaking processes are not inclusive, or worse, when the rules are drawn up by more advanced economies through mega bilateral or regional trading uh, argument agreements. Now, uh, this failure of international rulemaking is a disruption in itself, and national policies and regulations must adapt and catch up uh, accordingly. And we need to ensure policy flexibility to address the negative impact of climate change-related and anthropogenic environmental factors, 
including environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. Climate change related factors, biodiversity loss, um, and uh, rapid environmental degradation, the threat of rising temperatures, and uh, the exploitation of new sources of carbon based energy and natural resources, among others, have come at a huge multi dimensional cost, compelling governments to enact measures and, uh, and other policy instruments to adapt or internalize the cost of society. So the government must look to uh, being quite nimble at balancing uh, policy uh, implications of these measures with the need to counter out the negative externalities of economic and commercial activities in this regard. And finally, on the third C, uh, economic foreign policy is complex and multidimensional. As an effort at society building, there are many moving parts in the conduct of economic diplomacy, geopolitical tensions, rising protectionism and economic nationalism, as well as rapid technological advances, profound changes in the digital economy, environmental risk and social challenges, as well as widening the global income gap and other external factors is, is uh, uh, providing that added complexity for developing countries such as the Philippines to move up the higher income, middle income ladder. Moreover, uh, international economic integration or globalization is said to be to, or to have plateaued over the years. And uh, with the post-COVID-19 backdrop, paving the way perhaps for the next iteration of the Washington Consensus, waiting for uh, opportunity to, to gain some traction. And it, it, was, it is often observed that the dispute settlement mechanism, the crown jewel of the multilateral trading platform represented by the World Trade Organization is currently non-functional as well and provides an added complexity on how economies can settle disputes among themselves. We have seen also that uh, uh, any effort at expanding and securing economic opportunities in a challenging global environment must reckon with the current trade tensions between the US and China and uh, affecting other trading uh, relationships involving other big economies like Japan and Korea. Nevertheless, we see this also as an opportunity for the Philippines to expand uh, market access and commercial opportunities at the bilateral and regional levels. But managing such tensions um, can be quite uh, daunting, uh, especially as the Philippines challenges or, or, or tries to manage uh, the tensions it would be involved in uh, as it heads to a new era of re redefining relations with regional hegemons. And therefore, therefore, the Philippines must be more responsive to global economic and systemic risk and, and strengthen its domestic economic robustness and resilience. With global economic tensions uh, at play, systemic risks and political uncertainties, the, uh, the risk of uh, a lingering uh, economic uh, uh, slowdown would also impact on Philippine economic growth prospects. This is, this, this, this challenges are, are exemplified further by economic nationalism, protectionism, and anti-globalization sentiments. Therefore, we must look at ways to, to, to manage uh, this complexity. Case in point would be when uh, COVID-19, the pandemic hit, and uh, reduction of, uh, in the economy ground to a halt, consumption ground to a halt, and uh, trade and investment activities uh, virtually stopped and look for ways to, to manage uh, and to uh, jumpstart the economy. And one of the, the uh, more important uh, undertakings here was to work with our international partners uh, and uh, international uh, organizations to help uh, the Philippines address uh, the impact of the pandemic by working quickly to mobilize a foreign service post to uh, secure vaccines, to secure uh, the uh, therapeutics, and also um, to facilitate the resumption of cross-border travel. And uh, one of the things that probably we can uh, highlight here in this effort at promoting safe passage and something that uh, the tourism ministers uh, are discussing here in, in the APEC tourism ministers is uh, facilitating and resuming uh, cross-border travel uh, between the economies. And to this point, uh, the, the DFA has worked uh, with other government agencies 
in developing uh, the COVID-19 vaccination certificate, vaccine PH, and uh, taken uh, and made sure that uh, it's compliant with international standards. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, we need to look into uh, in, in ensuring that economic activity resumes, especially uh, in an industry that has that was worse to be hit by the pandemic and among the last to recover from the pandemic. And uh, uh, finally, as con countries transition in the new, into the new and hopefully better normal, uh, the Philippines must maintain its commitment to openness of trade on trade and investment and uh, work towards the resiliency and sustainability of supply chains and ensure the movement of essential goods, maintaining that inter interconnectedness among countries and among people. Uh, even as we uh, remain uncompromising our efforts to contain the pandemic uh, by, by implementing the necessary economic stimulus measures. And given these three Cs, let me, let me now try to, to draw some lessons here uh, that uh, may, I mean, may further uh, pass on to the succeeding speakers. Uh, first, uh, what's in, in, implicit in my reference to our trade, investment, opportunity, and cooperation with several countries is that Countries that keep peace are the same ones that prosper. Economic security at the end of the day is not a singular concept, but one that is tied to political security and stability. Second, in terms of comparative advantages, in, in the classic Ricardo sense, uh, international organizations and platforms like the WTO, APEC, ASEAN, and other bilateral, regional, multilateral platforms that we engage in Globalization and economic integration has benefited us, uh, be it through access to more accessible products and services and production inputs, access to export markets, and across uh, the various services modalities, and more especially through capacity building through economic and technical cooperation. However, as mentioned earlier, globalization has taken on a negative connotation due to the uh, perceived ill effects on the marginalized and, and the losers. The challenge, therefore, is to temper such concerns and address these through safety nets, upskilling and reskilling, and investments to effectively bridge the in income inequality uh, that uh, it is often correlated with. We must pay closer attention to providing just compensation and offsets relative to disruptive trade developments. And to this, when you look at the fourth industrial revolution, globalization 4.0, and web 3.0 frameworks that provide us uh, characterization of the challenges that we face, it also provides us a uh, framework for defining opportunities for growth. So we must adapt and calibrate thoughtfully. And we must be ready to embrace and pursue innovative approaches and in multilateral governance and bilateral harmonization. We must be ready to uh, participate in attempts to push the bounds and limits of uh, uh, innovations in regional governments, such as the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, RCEP, and the CPTPP, and find ways to engage bilaterally with our trading partners. Uh, following the page of what recently the U.S. is doing with, with Taiwan. Uh, third is uh, there is much room for enhancing economic diplomacy as an instrument or tool to implement our economic foreign policy to attain economic security. Concomitantly, for diplomacy to be a tool for cultivating and nurturing an ethos of social and personal responsibility in, in society. If we have representatives from foreign embassies uh, here, uh, they will know where, what we speak of uh, when we endeavor to uh, supplement and complement and implement foreign policy. And uh, the students who are present here from all sorts of backgrounds, economics, international studies, and diplomacy uh, may recognize many uh, of the uh, elements of their studies in what is happening uh, in the, in, around the world and the rationale behind our pursuits in pursuing economic diplomacy. So uh, with that, um, uh, allow me to wrap up uh, by uh, with with a uh, by borrowing from uh, bo borrowing a stylized uh, re digital rendering of a Shakespearean existential question, courtesy of uh, Kurt Vonnegut. In this digital age, uh, the challenge of relevancy bears upon government to enable our people to be the best that they can be, and for our people to be the best to be best served by the government that they deserve. So, to be or not to be, that is the question. And the current administration of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. signals 
uh, a return to active outreach with our international partners. And we are confident that his, and his administration uh, will uh, represent a, a resounding and re renewed voice in the uh, global stage. So with that, uh, I bid you good morning and uh, thank you very much. Maraming salamat and mabuhay. Thank you very much, uh, Asik Tamayo, for your keynote uh, talk. Uh, I now uh, invite uh, Asik Alan Gepti, but before that, let me introduce our reactor for this webinar, Assistant Secretary Alan Gepti, uh, who is Assistant Secretary for Industry Development and Trade Policy at the Department of Trade and Industry. As the Assistant Secretary for Industry Development and Trade Policy at the DTI, his main portfolio is international trade policy and trade negotiations at the bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels for the Philippine government. Asik Gepti was the Philippines' lead negotiator in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP Agreement, and also the country's senior economic official at the, at the Association for Southeast Asian Nations. He was a former Deputy Director General of the Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines and Commissioner of the Philippine Tariff Commission. He's a trained lawyer with experience in the field of litigation, commercial law, international trade, and intellectual property. May now invite As Asik Alan Gepti for his uh, reaction to the keynote speech. Uh, sir, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aris. And thank you also as Eric for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, of course, before I proceed with my reaction presentation, I'd like to extend first my most gratitude to the Foundation for National Interest and the uh, privilege to work Tom for giving me this opportunity to in a way share my insights and perspectives on this very important issue. I see also on the screen uh, Ambassador Laura de Rosario, mom, good morning, uh, Dr. Vincent Hosel, and colleagues in government. And I would like to assume also maybe we have some colleagues from the private sector. A pleasant day for all. The topic understanding economic security as a pillar of foreign policy resonates as a vision that if you want to maintain peace, and prevent war, then you have to establish a stable and robust economic environment where man's basic needs and wants are satisfied. In fact, we can say that economic security is also the foundation or the basic pillar of international peace and security. It is also at the same time the core or the pillar, if I may say so, of inclusiveness and development. So basically, just to give context, when you talk about economic security, this is about resources, resilience, and robustness. And noting that no state or economy for that matter has the luxury and advantage of having all the resources it needs, then it has to deal with other states or economies on a quid pro quo basis. In the olden times, the need to accumulate and amass resources has triggered conflicts and even world war. Thus, there is a truism in what French economist Frederick Bastiat mentioned that when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. That is why one of the outcomes of the Bretton Woods Conference is the establishment of the International Trade Organization that led eventually to the establishment of the World Trade Organization. So the jury is simple. Economic activities must continue and trade rules must be properly defined. Now, from the Philippine perspective, when you talk about international relations, then immediately what comes to mind is, of course, the mandate under the Constitution. This is very emphatic that in pursuing foreign relations, foreign policy for that matter, it has to be an independent foreign policy. And we have to be guided by this uh, very paramount consideration entrenched in the Constitution, which are national sovereignty, territorial integrity, national interest, and the right to self-determination. As a policy direction, 
The Constitution also mandates that the state shall promote a just and dynamic social order that will ensure the prosperity and independence of the area and free the people from poverty to policies that provide adequate social services, promote full employment, a rising standard of living, and an improved quality of life for all. In addition, the Constitution also provides it shall promote social justice in all cases of national development. Now, relative to economic and trade policy, the Constitution also mandates that the state shall pursue a trade policy that serves the general welfare and utilizes all forms and arrangements of exchange on the basis of equality and reciprocity. Bear with me, colleagues, if I sound legal and if I have to cite certain constitutional provision, because I have to provide context also to the very topic and to my comments to the presentation of Asik Tamar. Now, if you will peruse our constitution, in terms of economic policy, one of the, uh, I would say, uh, primary criticism on our constitution is that it is basically pro Filipino. Some of our policies may be viewed as protectionist. And that has been the constant challenge also of our policy makers here in the country, especially in crafting our domestic policy vis-a-vis -vis our international commitments. Now, there is this one case decided by the Supreme Court, the case of Tanyada versus Angara. This basically resolves the constitutionality of our participation to the World Trade Organization or the WTO agreements for the past. And if I may quote, the Supreme Court clarified that while the Constitution indeed mandates a bias in favor of Filipino, it recognizes the need for business exchange with the rest of the world on the basis of equality and reciprocity and limits protection of Filipino enterprises only against foreign competition and trade practices that are unfair. In other words, the Constitution did not intend to pursue an isolationist policy. It did not shut foreign investments, goods and services in the development of the Philippine economy. The Supreme Court further clarified that the fundamental law encourages industries that are competitive in both domestic and foreign markets, thereby demonstrating a clear policy against a sheltered domestic trade environment, but one in favor of the gradual development robust industries that can compete with the best in the foreign markets. Mindful of this clarification and commitments, oh, sorry, mindful of this clarification, what commitments and the interests of the country must be viewed in the context therefore, of socioeconomic development. Thus, in trade policy crafting, the goals of the national economy are more equitable distribution of opportunities, income and wealth, a sustained increase in the amount of goods and services produced by the nation for the benefit of the people and expanding productivity as the key to raising the quality of life of all, especially the underprivileged. And it is on this point that you will notice the importance of what Asik Eric mentioned earlier, the second C, which is more on the changing policy, taking into account context and challenges. So in other words, on the transition of economic development, you will know that from inward policies, we have moved towards an open economy, or what, as Eric mentioned earlier, economic liberalization. Because it is viewed that economic liberalization is one good policy to, in a, to in a way, reduce poverty in the country. Now, given that the Philippines has embraced globalization and an open economy, we have to ensure that our stakeholders are well integrated into the global economy. How this is being done? This is done through different levels of international engagement, from economic cooperation, usually done through our joint economic cooperation, the blackboard of which is the usual memorandum of understanding or memorandum of agreements. We have various fora like the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. We have, of course, uh, ASEAN, WTO, among others, to hardcore commitments under free trade agreements. The ASEAN agreement, the ASEAN plus one agreement, our bilateral agreements, and of course, negotiations and trade agreements concluded 
at the multilateral level, particularly the WTO. Now, at the domestic scene, we have to do a lot of legislative reforms to, in a way, align our policies to these international commitments and engagement in the process. And recently, I would like to highlight major economic reforms that we have passed, such as the trade law, the amendments to the Foreign Investment Act, amendments to the Public Service Act, the Retail Pay Liberalization Act, the passing of Innovation Act, the Innovative Startup Act, and even the establishment of various offices, such as Innovation Technology Support Offices, Innovation Centers, among others. And it is on this aspect where you will know the first seat mentioned by ASIC Mary, which is when it comes to promoting the country, there is a constant and consistent policy that we have embraced. And these are trade promotion, investment promotion, and technical cooperation. So basically, these three activities, or I would say programs, that we have been carrying out through the years are anchored under this platform that they have. Now, the most interesting question then is that what is the impact of these various engagements, in particular free trade agreements, to the Philippines? How did we benefit from these uh, engagements or trade agreements for the planet? Well, of course, offhand, we have to bear in mind that when you talk about free trade agreements, these are just policy tools. And it being a tool, then it has to be utilized, it has to be availed of. And if you will utilize the same, then the immediate benefits that you will realize will be, of course, market access to foreign markets, because we negotiate the uh, reduction of tariff rates, if not the elimination of tariff rates, and also the removal of non-tariff barriers and conformance to certain standards to facilitate trade. Of course, it has opened a lot of opportunities for our workers, professionals, service providers, and also investors. It has attracted investments, competition, and of course, for our manufacturing sector, it is an access to cheaper goods, cheaper intermediate goods, cheaper raw materials. To give you a concrete example, based on our 2021 data, 48% or roughly half of Philippine exports go to our FDA partners. In the case of our bilateral free trade agreement with Japan, which is the Philippine-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, after the entry into force of this agreement, we have noted an approval of investment from Japan went from an average of 206, 206 million pesos annually from 1999 to 2008 it went to 489 million pesos from 2009 to 2018. Another example is the Philippine European Free Trade Agreement, where the trade balance with Switzerland went from a deficit of $36 million upon entering the course in 2018 to a surplus of $207 million in 2021. Now, the big challenge is the battle towards economic supremacy. Among big economies, I think, as Eric mentioned about the trade war between the United States and China. And this has been compounded by the evolving economic environment brought about by non traditional challenges, as climate change and, of course, COVID 19 and other health uh, challenges, such as the monkeypox, among others, which led us to our current situation right now, which is the pandemic. And this basically reflects what I think Eric mentioned about the third C, the complexities of international relations, the multifaceted aspect of uh, trade policies, economic policies in the process, the challenge of embracing or entertaining inward policies, the challenge of maintaining your markets open for trade and investment. Now, the two main questions Therefore, would be one, how can you prevent geopolitical tensions, not to say unwarranted conflict, while addressing the evolving non traditional challenges? So, I'm referring to the battle of supremacy by our GDP economy. And there is, of course, the trade war between the United States and China. And, of course, we're facing a lot of uh, challenges right now, as you mentioned, climate change, COVID 19, among others. The second question is, where do we position the Philippines in the scheme of things? 
or better yet, how do we position them? My submission is that economic interdependence between and among countries, or more specifically the global supply chain, is also the solution. The more integrated economies are into the global economy, and what the conflict will be remote, if not avoided. According to Wharton Dean Joffrey Garrett, while the trade war between the United States and China continues to take its toll, global supply chains provide what he calls a forced provision, for instance, in ending the standoff, because they bind the two countries in prosperity. According to him, there are three chairs for supply chains. One, supply chains are at the core of the modern global economy. Second, supply chains will help resolve the China-US trade war. And third, supply chains will make a new old war less effective. The reason for this is that, contrary to some notion, production of goods and services have already been revolutionized by international trade. Goods and services are no longer either made in America or made in China or made in the Philippines. In that the United States wins when the products in America and exported to China and loses when it imports products in China. In today's global economy, products are put together in one country from components sourced in one country or in other countries and then sold all over the world. As a result, vastly fewer products are sold in made in America, made in the Philippines, or made in China or any one country. For example, Huawei matters a great deal to American business. About one quarter of the components in Huawei products are supplied by leading American tech companies led by Broadcom, Flex, and Qualcomm. For Apple devices, note that they are designed by Apple in California, symbol in China. It does not say made in China because Apple devices are almost exclusively available on the Chinese mainland, predominantly by a Taiwan spur, Paxcon from components coming from America, Asia, and Europe. Now, on addressing non traditional challenges to climate change in the pandemic, the need for collaboration and partnership is a must. And I think Masik Kenek also highlighted this, particularly when we were working on having a, an access to affordable vaccines. Thus, in various FPA negotiations and international engagement, Provisions on environment, climate change, sustainability, and cooperation in times of pandemic and calamities are being introduced. In other words, the platform is still economics and is meant to disrupt the economic activities and the supply chain. And for these emerging issues, challenges from the conventional trade agreements that we're used to, that is market access, now in FTA, human norms and negotiations are now more focused on rules and discipline, not necessarily on market access. So, in sum, countries are now interdependent in each other. And in this time and age where global economy is highly dependent on the global value chain and transfer of technology, it is rather imperative that we strengthen the platform that paves the way for the supply chain to work efficiently and effectively. On the positioning of the Philippines, we have to enhance, of course, our relationship with our trading partners, both traditional and non-traditional partners. If you will know, in the past administration, we have been very aggressive in forging economic relations with non-traditional partners. Because if you will analyze the trade configuration of the Philippines, 50% of our export markets goes to our FTA partners, basically ASEAN and the ASEAN plus one partners. But for non FTA partners, you will see that almost 20% of our export market goes to the United States and also around 50 to 20% goes to the European Union. The rest are, of course, distributed to the other countries. So basically, there are a lot of platforms and also opportunities that we can take advantage of. One is the FTA, and for the EU, what we are enjoying right now is the EU GSP Plus. And for the United States, we are hoping to forge the FTA, but right now we are working hard for the reauthorization also of our US GSP. So these are the mechanisms by which we are trying to uh, uh, work on, 
and further strength in. And of course, recently um, we have uh, joined the negotiation and the eventual conclusion of the regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement, which is considered the largest free trade deal in the world. And this is one important FTA that Philippines couldn't avoid that to participate in. So we hope to get your support on this, to advocate, and of course, not lobby that uh, the senators should already act on the concurrence process. Uh, in the pipeline, we have been working also on a possible comprehensive economic partnership agreement with the United Arab Emirates. We are set to embark also on a preferential trade agreement with India. Uh, by the way, we just concluded also the uh, bilateral free trade agreement with South Korea, and we hope to sign the same this coming November. And of course, uh, we are very active with the CN Plus One FAH review. And at the regional platform, we are now uh, embarking in an ASEAN Canada FTA. We have also joined the Indo Pacific Economic Framework initiated by the United States, basically to strengthen their presence here in the region. And of course, we are still working on the resumption of our bilateral FTA negotiation with the European Union. And hopefully, the United States will also heed our call in a way, sit down with us and let you say a bilateral FTA. So in terms of policy direction um, under the current administration, it remains the same. So the track is to expand the export market, encourage more investment through these various international investments. And then, of course, lastly, I would like to uh, stress that more than entrenching our presence and participation in these various fora, be it multilateral, plurilateral, or bilateral, it is very important that we have to continue investing in human resource development. It's a battle of skills. And as I like that we asked Eric earlier, not only that we have to reskill, we have to upskill also our team. And people is one best resource that we have, especially here in the Philippines. And in fact, it has been my mantra that if you would like to position the Philippines here in the region, the Philippines can well serve as one of the manufacturing hub in Southeast Asia. And an innovation hub because we have the advantage of legal and institutional uh, frameworks in the country, not to mention the, uh, we'll say the competent people and professionals that we have. We can also position the Philippines as a center for training and education, and of course, center for research and development. So I hope I was able to, in a way, give context on the topic as well as to the presentation of ASIC Mary. So if you have any questions, I would be more than willing to address. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, uh, Asik Alan Gepti, for uh, your remarks. Uh, indeed, there's a lot of challenges that uh, the Philippines face at the uh, in the current economic downturn or slowdown. Uh, both speakers emphasize the importance of uh, pursuing diplomacy and uh, efforts to ensure that. Uh, disputes are settled peacefully and, and that geopolitical tensions will not affect uh, global trade and, and supply chains. There's also made mention of the importance of pandemic recovery, uh, the importance of pursuing bilateral uh, trade uh, negotiations or strengthening them with both traditional and non-traditional partners and of course, reviewing our current uh, trade packs with uh, other countries. And finally, an investment in human resources as the need to upscale, rescale, as well as uh, invest uh, in uh, promoting and, and improving human capital in the Philippines. Okay, we, with, with that, I... Uh, we now invite our participants to field their questions or, or comments again please use the chat function uh, that is found on your Zoom uh, platform if you uh, would want to uh, ask a question to either uh, Asik Tamayo or Asik Gepti. Okay, while we wait for some of our participants, uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to 
to ask a a a, a quick question on on both our uh, speakers. Uh, the the current trend of uh, trade and, and or supply protectionism is uh, hitting a lot of countries that are whose whose trade uh, trade balance uh, is heavily tilted towards uh, importation, such as the Philippines. Uh, what do you think are uh, the main uh, quick solutions? If there are quick solutions on this. And, and how can we prevent the vulnerability of countries like the Philippines uh, to shocks of uh, supply, important supply of goods uh, being, pro being protected or secured by countries who produce them? Uh, we've seen uh, this in flour, uh, and, and we might see this possibly in the future with other basic foodstuffs like rice and, and even sugar. Okay. Uh, Dr. Aris, if I may. Yes, please. That. Yes, please, okay. ask Alan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aris. Uh, well, number one, uh, on the matter of importation, I think uh, one important point that I'd like to stress, I mean, is you have to discard that notion that importation is bad. I mean, there's nothing wrong with importation. Uh, you import because you need the products that you are importing. You import because you need certain intermediate goods, raw materials for production and manufacturing processes. So I think uh, that's one important. Now, of course, uh, since when we talk about economic security, it's also important that you have that element of resilience. So resilience basically uh, connotes also that you have enough resources to, in a way, fuel your local industries and, of course, address your local demands for it. And the one challenge that we have in the Philippines is, of course, the trade deficit that is with respect to goods. Uh, that's the reality that we have to face. Uh, for several years, consistently, we have been in deficit, and the deficit, unfortunately, has been in deficit. But one thing that maybe I would like to highlight is that starting 2015, if you will analyze our uh, trade uh, data, there is a substantial improvement in the manufacturing growth, in the growth rate of our manufacturing sector, uh, starting 2015, at the average of around 6.1%. Of course, this was disrupted by the pandemic. Also, if you will analyze the influx of important goods, you will know that 63% of the avenues of these goods are intermediate goods. So what does it tell you? It tells you that you have a working, functioning, robust manufacturing sector. And this is the kind of momentum that we would like to maintain. So we hope that in the process, uh, we can, in a way, resurrect our manufacturing sector. And that has been the program of the Department of Trade and Industry. That is why forging and, of course, participating in this project is very important because this is one way by which you can integrate your local stakeholders to the global supply chain. So we hope that uh, you know, our stakeholders, policymakers, the general public will take that up. Another important point that I'd like to highlight is that when you talk about trade relations, we're just talking about the little points. Because in goods, we are in deficit. But when you talk about services, we are in surplus. And consistently, we have been in surplus because our economy basically is anchored and surplus. So that is our niche. And that is our comparative advantage. So we have to further strengthen that. So when I say services, we are very strong on professional services. Business services. And under business services, there are complementary services that would also help you well from other sectors. So you have the telecommunication and also tourism in the process and travel uh, sectors would, uh, you know, fuel the economy. So this is what we want to maintain. In addition to services, there's another aspect also investment. So if you have a stable, predictable business environment, then expect that your investment will increase. 
it's a simple thing of saying that if your business environment is okay, I mean, at any given time, it will not be disrupted. Notwithstanding the change in government officials, for example, or administration, then the investors will come in because they would expect certain predictability in their business operation. So in other words, here are the three areas that we have to look at. Goods, services, and investment. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harris. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Asik Gepti. Uh, Asik Tamayo, do you have some uh, remarks? Yes, please. Well, yes, just to uh, uh, maybe I, I look at this uh, from a standpoint of uh, political economic, uh, uh, in, in political economic context. Uh, if uh, you try to assess, you, you look at uh, the pushback that we've seen, that, that, that we're seeing concerning uh, regionalism or um, uh, economic integration on a regional basis or an international basis. Uh, these, the, the situation that we find ourselves in, uh, we've seen over the years that uh, uh, certain sectors have tried to, to uh, correlate uh, inequalities, inequities uh, with globalization. Uh, and many of the champions of globalization have already either retired or passed on so probably need the new champions, new people to articulate this. Um, and probably we need someone to combat the misinformation uh, that uh, are out there, right? that will be out there. Uh, because uh, uh, it is easy to, to blame globalization for the uh, uh, lack of uh, action domestically. Uh, a case in, well, uh, there are many cases probably in the Philippines, but but if you look at uh, Brexit, for instance, or Trump's uh, call for uh, nationalism, uh, he's feeding on nostalgia here, uh, hearkening to glory times. And, uh, you, you know, this is something that uh, uh, you cannot undo already. What we've... Uh, uh, what the, the UK had already uh, accomplished uh, post-EU... Uh, and wanting to return to it, it's just impossible. Uh, and, and it may be even more harmful to, to it. And what Trump has been advocating is a return to some to, to, to a situation where you cannot go, they cannot go back to, uh, essentially. So uh, leveling the expectations, putting the right information out there, uh, it, it, it's hard. It's very challenging for policymakers. So you need a good communications plan. Uh, if you look at our uh, experience in trying to push for the ratification of RCEP, there's a lot of information going on uh, regarding uh, uh, the implications for the Philippines. And uh, as kept, he had worked very hard to, to push for it uh, as well. Uh, and we find ourselves here uh, as well, uh, renewing uh, our push for, for the ratification. So it is, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, basically uh, uh, a need to come up uh, with a good comms, comms plan to, to battle inf misinformation. Uh, it is understandable. Uh, perhaps uh, we need to pay attention to the concerns, valid ones of that, at uh, displacement and loss for people who will be disrupted, the livelihoods uh, that will be disruptive, dis disrupted by, by these uh, arrangements uh, at uh, more economic integration. After all, we're not, we're not uh, giving up sovereignty. We're delegating it, perhaps, to some extent. We are not uh, after equality in regula uh, regulations, but we are after harmo harmonizing standards. We're, it's, we're not after equality of standards here. So it is uh, something that it's hard to impart, to communicate with people, but uh, that, that's a challenge, I guess. And... Uh, um, it, 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 and uh, the mood, the public mood has demonstrated, has shown that uh, they are more inclined to, to find answers to the questions that uh, seem to easily blame it on uh, liberalization uh, efforts by, by policymakers. So that, that is, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a question here for, for, for you, Asik Tamayo, uh, given that you've been talking about globalization. Do you think the supposed uh, Bretton Woods 3 would strengthen globalization or reinforce the desire for regionalism or limited multilateralism or limited bilateralism? 
Well, that that's a very interesting. Uh, the the uh, uh, Bretton Woods uh, uh, institutions. Uh, the first two uh, were the, you had no problem establishing them. The third one was the more challenging one, and th that is, I think, one of the more uh, pressing concerns. Uh, the um, uh, uh, w w when you uh, th these these sort of uh, uh, initiatives uh, again are the underlying concept here is to to build up uh, these kinds of linkages that make it uh, uh, hard to think of or even contemplate uh, a certain uh, uh, courses of action that may undo uh, this sort of integration. Um, but as you can see with Ukraine, uh, uh, someone with a different uh, idea uh, can just uh, push through with uh, uh, what he believes would be uh, his right and prerogative to do, uh, even as uh, it runs counter to this uh, to the efforts of the of uh, of other of its partners uh, to to uh, not not uh, not to think of those. Uh, <laughs> resource of uh, courses of action right. and uh, now uh, we're faced with a situation where uh, we, we have to try to make some adjustments so the Bretton Woods institution uh, the, the, the third one the, especially uh, the, the current iteration of the World Trade Organization the, the multilateral trading system is currently uh, uh, in limbo <laughs> essentially when when you have <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the dispute settlement mechanism uh, not functioning. And um, um, while it is uh, 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 prompting uh, countries to look at ways to settle disputes amongst themselves, which is probably in some ways also good, but uh, it, it, it uh, runs counter uh, intuitively to the notion that uh, uh, we need to to move rapidly in this uh, the realm of the, this this dispute and uniformly in dispute settlement. So um, there, there, perhaps there needs to be a consensus on how to move forward with with, with this. Um, and uh, we are of course waiting for signals from from the main party who was uh, blocking the. Uh, uh, the uh, functioning of this uh, uh, the, the, the WTO. Uh, so we, we, there, there's a need to 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 uh, move a little bit faster than than uh, than what we have now in terms of listening to the concerns of this country, and also our desire to uh, uh, have a have a process that will address uh, these disputes and to ensure. Uh, uh, that uh, that uh, we have this uh, uh, functioning, uh, more or less uh, a level playing field at uh, settling these disputes, or if, should we resort to to disputes at that? Right. Uh, there's a question here. I'll, I'll, I want to field this to to Asik Allen. Uh, there's a lot of. Um, apprehension on the, the current geopolitical tensions between the U.S. And, and China, the threat of decoupling of the two economies. Uh, is the Philippines really going to lose a lot uh, against such uh, in such a decoupling? Or I've also read uh, certain analysis wherein, in fact, the, the trade war between the U.S. and China, in fact, has benefited some ASEAN economies in, in which the U.S. has shifted uh, some of its um, investments in China towards countries like Vietnam. But to what extent is the Philippines really losing or are we somehow benefiting from, from the current uh, uh, geopolitical tensions that has ripple effects on, on trade and the economic relations between the U.S. and China? Thank you, uh, Dr. Iris. Um, I will uh, answer that uh, in the context of uh, economics. Uh, number one is that uh, 
I mean, trade war or economic wars for that matter is not something. Uh, in the 70s, we have experienced trade war between the United States. And if you will note, uh, at that time, as a reaction to the fact that the U.S. market is being flooded by force of Japanese cars, Japanese products, products. they have imposed also high tariffs. And what's the effect of that uh, trade war in the late 70s? So basically, there are a lot of industries that were established in the region. And I think I can cite that it has triggered also the establishment of the electronic industry in Southeast Asia, the automobile industry, that's why the manufacturing plants have been separated here in the region, because at that time, cars coming from Japan would be imposed like a guy of civilians. So that's number one. Number two, on the aspect of US China conflict in the trade and economic aspect, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is just, I would say, very solved if there are economies competing to be supreme in economic trade. And I have mentioned in my reaction earlier that if there is one positive point that we have to take into account is that the solution also to this conflict basically is economics, particularly the global supply chain. Because economists right now are highly interdependent. So basically, we need this other, that we can afford to buy. Because if you do so, then the result is, obviously, you will distract economic activities. You will distract the supply chain. And I think we have seen, partly, the effects of having this kind of funding because of the Russia-Ukraine war. Because of that, we have suffered a lot of shortages, certain commodities, prices went up. So in other words, this is just an indication of the effects if economic activities will be disrupted or supply chain will be disrupted. So you can just imagine if this will be further escalated in, a, I would say, a global context. So the effects would really be devastating. That is why I have mentioned earlier, what is important is that we have to sustain that economic engagement. And it's a good thing that on that aspect, still, Policymakers, senior officials are still very active in forging free trade agreements and also other international engagement. So, for example, we have the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. We have the Comprehensive Progressive Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement. Recently, the United States was initiated this what we call the Asia Pacific Economic Framework. So, it is a non traditional trade agreement, and it is a part of the region also in this uh, forum. So basically, there are so many things happening in the economic arena or in the economic field, and this is a positive thing. In terms of geopolitical tension, uh, of course, uh, we have a lot of, I would say, seasoned diplomats, leaders, among others, who know the consequences of, you know, uh, I would say, uh, not being careful in addressing this. Uh, and maybe uh, it is to mind that in the past, uh, the world, in a way, has been used to this kind of, you know, conflict. Uh, if you will recall, we have experienced the Cold War era. Also at the time, there is uh, also this conflict in, of course, the, the Korean Peninsula, for example, South Korea, North Korea. There is always one of the calculated chaos uh, on certain uh, parts of the region. So these are the reality that sometimes we have to face. And that is why it's very important that at least on the economic aspect, we will stay in that. Because as long as we have that economic interdependence and that we are well mindful of the devastating consequences of disrupting these economic activities, then I think uh, we can still uh, move on past in the right direction. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you, uh, thank you Asik Alan. Uh, there's a question here I, I like to feel to, to both our speakers. Uh, what is the government's stance on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework? Should the Philippines join the discussions, the current discussions on, on IPEF? Uh, Asik Eric? Well, um, um, Asik Alan will be uh, the definitive person uh, to address this because, uh, well, we, we're both involved. Uh, he's the point person. 
in our engagement with the IPF currently. And, uh, that is something that uh, yes, we are we are a part of it. Uh, we we are happy to be uh, among the uh, first conveners of the IPF. But as to the current stand, I will leave it to Aptek uh, as a to to elaborate further. Okay. Thank you, uh, Asik Harik. So basically, uh, the community agencies uh, on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework are DDI and of course the Department of Foreign Affairs. And the Philippines is a partner or participant no, on this uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, participating in four pillars. The four pillars is number one, the trade pillar. Second pillar is the supply chain. The third pillar is clean economy. And the fourth pillar is the fair economy. So we're now in the process of negotiating uh, basically the parameters for the uh, main uh, negotiation on the framework. And there's a scheduled ministerial meeting uh, this coming September, September 8 and 9. And we're hoping that uh, ministerial statements will be issued in the four pillars that we have. So we're really active in that uh, item. If, if I may just add quickly there as well, uh, just to note that uh, uh, we see this also as uh, a component of an overall effort from the United States as well uh, on, the, on its Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, that, that overarching uh, political security initiative that it is uh, also undertaking with uh, its uh, partners, particularly uh, the Quad, uh, you have India, Japan, and Australia, and the, and the United States uh, anchoring this, this uh, uh, initiative on the Indo-Pacific strategy. And the IPF is, uh, uh, the, uh, we see this as a, a manifestation and ex as an expression of this IPS uh, of the U.S., which has gone through several iterations. You, you've, uh, you recall uh, Obama's uh, pivot to the U.S. and also Trump's uh, version of the Indo-Pacific, and then the IPS is the uh, current iteration of Biden, and the, the IPF is, is a, a, a tangible uh, uh, expression of, of this uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Okay, uh, for our last question, uh, apologies to, to our participants. Uh, how is, is a question related to balancing uh, economic liberalization and regulation? How do we situate our regulatory framework if the current policy or approach is to op further open up our economies, are there areas of industry that should remain protected? Uh, for example, in the EU, they're quite protectionist with uh, local communities, businesses, and traditionally uh, agriculture. Maybe um, Asik Allen and Asik Eric, if, if you can respond to the question. Uh, I'll go first, as a Eric, if you don't mind. Well, number one, uh, Dr. Iris, uh, we have to bear in mind that we have already embraced an open economy. So we're already in an era of globalization. And so, therefore, it is very difficult for us to reverse the situation and embrace an inward policy or a protectionist policy for them. Uh, we have a lot of free trade agreements, uh, multilateral, regional, and of course bilateral. And under international law, we have to make good our commitments in these various free trade agreements. Now, on the aspect of regulation and also protecting our other industries, it doesn't mean that just because you have embraced an open economy, it follows that you are already absolutely opening the market without any safety nets or measures. In every free trade agreement, we are well mindful in protecting sensitive sectors of the country. So for example, when you talk about agriculture sector, you talk about sugar, you talk about rice, you talk about pork, among others. So basically, in our FTAs, these subsectors are well protected. So in other words, either the tariff rates are, of course, maintained, or in other words, we are not offering them to be reduced or eliminated. Number two, we have to ensure that trade remedies are available. So what are these trade remedies? We have, for example, the safeguard measures, meaning if there is an increase in volume of potential, then 
uh, industry, the local industry can always go to the Department of Trade and Industry and the Tariff Commission to ask for the imposition of safeguard measures. If there is, let's say, an unwarranted practice of, let's say, dumping certain important products in the country, we have the anti dumping measures, which we can always resort to. If certain products are also receiving unwarranted uh, subsidies from the uh, exporting country, then we have the counter trading measures. Uh, of course, um, in addition to those trade remedies that I mentioned, we have the security exceptions, we have the general exceptions, we have even provisions on modification of commitments. In other words, there are a lot of safety nets, there are a lot of safety measures. And the challenge really, and I would say that this is one big challenge for our local industries, is the availment or utilization of these trade remedies and measures. Because uh, while these uh, safety nets are there, if they are not aware of the very least or they are not familiar of utilizing these trade remedies, then that's really a problem. That is, that, that is fine. It's also the, I would say, the obligation of the court to really enlighten our local industries, our local stakeholders, that uh, there are available remedies to ensure that uh, they would remain competitive in the international territory. So let's see, uh, let's try to that, uh, please, and maybe ask it. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, if, if I may just quickly also uh, uh, comment here. Uh, yes, uh, as Alan uh, um, already uh, outlined that we have our at disposal uh, several measures and, and resources to ensuring that uh, we can manage disruptions. We can uh, 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 also put up protections. Uh, should it be necessary? I, I think what what is fundamentally, I think, uh, uh, something that bears keeping in mind from time to time is that uh, uh, e economic integration and trade and investment uh, these are wealth creating activities. So that is uh, a given, and uh, there's a deliberate effort to to engage and link with the global uh, community. Uh, to, to afford uh, these benefits to our population and also for our own enterprises to have a more global mindset to maybe not only produce for the Philippines, but produce for the world. And, uh, um, and if they need more time to, 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 to prepare themselves for that, then so be it. Uh, we have at our, our, at our disposal uh, several, several measures to, to help them do that. Uh, but we need... To, to face uh, the reality that uh, uh, there, there's also a need to prepare ourselves for the eventuality that uh, some of these measures uh, may require uh, uh, an assessment from time to time. And uh, uh, we, we need to be uh, uh, ready with uh, uh, the kind of disruption that may be expected. Uh, what has been, this, this is a whole of government, whole of country uh, in, uh, undertaking. Uh, we in, in, in diplomacy and in, in international trade, uh, we, we can do our part, but we, this also uh, has to be complemented by efforts domestically, uh, like maybe controlling smuggling or um, also uh, um, uh, making sure that uh, compensation offsets go directly to the beneficiaries and not go to some, some project that would have no uh, direct impact on those affected. So those kinds of things, I think uh, we need to, to make sure that uh, we are ready to, and, and we, we are on board and in these undertakings. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Asik Tamayo and Asik Gepti. Uh, I am now closing the uh, Q&A uh, section of our webinar. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions fielded by our participants. May now invite Ambassador Lola, uh, Laura Del Rosario, President of Miriam College and Trustee of the of FNI, uh, to uh, give the closing remarks for today's webinar. Ma'am Lula? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wish to thank the, the two assistant secretaries and, of course, to, to thank our partner, Frederick Stifton, okay, and, of course, Vincent. I haven't met you yet, you know, 
face to face, but I hope to meet you to meet you soon. I, I think that the discussion now. I'm, I'm glad that we are going on with. Um, I mean, we're proceeding. Um, we have not really disrupted our efforts in economic integration and improving our economic uh, diplomacy and improving our economic situation. The, the thing that um, I, I hope that we can just, I'm looking forward, no? I mean, if we can have some kind of a post discussion on this, we, we just want to know, for instance, like is our capacity, you know, to expand how much how, how much is our capacity to expand since there's so much that the DTI and DFA are doing in terms of expanding our markets. Because when I was in government, our, our problem then, I'm talking about more than six years ago, especially during the APEC year, was ramping up our production and also answering to the, to the demands for our services. So I, I think uh, I, I would have wanted a discussion on this on our capacities in both the services and the manufacturing sector and how we can how we can address you know our capacity in this but as a whole i think it's very comforting to know that our government is doing well and that all our officials are doing their best really to make sure that our economic security is strong and that whatever shocks will happen in the regional environment we will continue to to grow and to be strong Thank you very much and have a pleasant day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Lula. Uh, FNI uh, is uh, posting the evaluation form in, in the chat box. Uh, to all our participants, please accomplish the form. It will uh, greatly help us in, in assessing and planning future uh, econ security talks and uh, we are also planning to hold more talks in the coming months uh, on uh, key topics related to economic security. Uh, this includes uh, talks uh, related to assessing China's uh, BRI, particularly in the Philippines and Southeast Asia for September, barriers and opportunities in the blue economy uh, sometime in October, and strategic partnerships for the digital economy in November. So, Please stay tuned to our social media handles of FNI, ARS, uh, FAX, and, and FES uh, for uh, announcements on the particular details of this upcoming econ security talks. With, with, with that, may I uh, again thank uh, our speakers for today, uh, ASIC Eric Tamayo, ASIC uh, Alan Gepti, uh, Mamlula, and everyone who has participated uh, we've reached a considerable number of participants. At one point, I think we reached around 113. So many thanks to our participants for uh, staying with us, uh, even if it's a Friday. And again, on behalf of uh, FNI, ARS, FAX, and our partner, FES, thank you very much. And we'll see you uh, in our future Econ Security Talks. Uh, please keep safe and have a happy weekend.